Thanks so much for tuning in today. I'm so excited that you're here. We are going to have a short word, but a deep word today. And I cannot see your comments. Let me see if I can pull it up on my phone. We're having some technical issues this morning. And so um, usually I have a monitor here in front of me showing your comments, and I don't have that today. Um, but Gunner's working on getting it all fixed. Okay. Um, I'm so glad you're here. Thanks for tuning in. I'm looking at the names, let's see, that I just saw. Raymond and Allie and Malisha, Gabriella. I hope I said that. Malisha, maybe. John, thanks so much for tuning in today. We are going to talk today about a divine alignment a little bit and also about uh, the Lord going deep. And this is a word that is going to be a tiny little preview of some of the things we'll be discussing at our women's retreat here in house in two weeks. But I just feel like I need to release part of this to everybody. And I believe it's going to be uh, a, a confirmation, if you will, a witness to what the Lord is saying. Um, Gunnar, could you possibly bring this camera down just a little bit? I'm a little too short and that camera is a little too tall. Sorry, guys. We're just making sure. Thank you much, much better. Okay. Well, we're going to go to the Lord today in prayer and um, let's just let's just seek him for his word. You know, we don't need a word from me. You need a word from the Lord. So let's pray. Father, in Jesus name, we come to you and Lord, we just ask that you would revelate through me today and through every person watching this video and who will watch later. And I ask, Father, that you would teach us. Holy Spirit, we remind you that your word says that you are our teacher. You are the one who guides us into all truth. You are the one who mentors us. And so we ask, Holy Spirit, of revelation, that you'd give us revelation, that you'd speak to us today. Lord, we bind off hindrances and technical malfunctions in Jesus' name, and we lose your perfect flow and your holy word here today. And I ask, Lord, that your spirit of prophecy would rise up in us and through us, Father, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, everybody, thank you, thank you again for tuning in. I'm so glad you're here. Today we are going to talk again about deep. Just a little preview about deep. And here's why this is on my heart. I feel like what the Lord is saying and doing across his body is really a reversal of what you would expect or think if you want to go deeper with God. For example, and just to kind of summarize, I feel like quiet is the new loud. Small is the new big. Few are the new many. Um, you know, and, and so what I mean by that is that on the fleshly side, when we want to go deeper with God and we want to be promoted into new levels with God, we think, oh God, it's going to be so sensational. It's going to be obvious to everybody else. It's going to involve worldwide influence. It's going to involve, you know, a promotion that, that you're flaunting me to the world. And sometimes God does that. There's nothing wrong with that. Those things are good. But sometimes God does a, a holy reversal and he looks deep on the inside. Of course, he always looks deep on the inside, right? But sometimes the work that he's doing, the promotion that he's doing, and so on, is so deep that it's too holy for anyone else to see. And I believe right now that God is calling his people to the thing that is so deep that it's too holy for anyone else to see. And for that reason that he is pulling people away from the spotlight, that he is pulling people away from the many to pour into the few, that he is pulling people away from the loud to commune with him in the quiet, that he is pulling people away from the big to delight in the small and to revel in the intimacy of the small things with God. 
Now, if you can imagine this, I mean, of course, you can see what I mean if you compare it to, say, a marriage, you know. The most intimate parts of marriage are going to happen in utter privacy. They're not something that everybody sees. Now, everybody can see the results. If the wife um, ends up with child, you know, then you can tell that husband and wife have been together in that intimate way. But the most intimate parts of that relationship are not for public viewing. Well, in the same way, God, when he wants to be closer to you, he will pull you away. And I believe this is what he's doing for so many. Let me see in the comments if he is, if this is resonating with you. I'm trying to pull this up on my phone because we're still having technical problems. But um, let me see in the comments if this is you. Just say, that's me. If you feel like God is pulling you away from the big things, the loud things, the obvious things, the public things, into a very deep, somewhat quiet, very personal season. And I'll be watching your comments there. But um, we see a really good example of this with, Ab excuse me, with Abraham. Abraham was a man who communed with God in the black of night, in the wee hours of the morning. He communed with God, not even with his wife. Remember, his wife was the one who laughed at God. She didn't know him like that. Abraham was the one who knew God. God showed up in person to see Abraham along with two angels. Um, Abraham and God were so, so tight. They were so close. Abraham was God's friend. God called him his friend. But there's a famous essay. It's actually a chapter written in a book, but it's also a standalone essay by A.W. Tozer, who's one of my favorite theologians. He's generally considered to be the greatest theologian of the 20th century. He died in 1963, A.W. Tozer, and he wrote a book, um, and in that, in, in, well, he wrote lots of books, but one of his books is, uh, let's see, what was the name of this book? I've just got the essay portion pulled up, but it's called The Saint Must Walk Alone. I think it might be The Pursuit of God, but uh, I'm not sure. Anyway, The Saint Must Walk Alone. And in The Saint Must Walk Alone, A.W. Tozer points out that um, Abraham was a man, quotes, whose soul was a, like a star and dwelt apart. And he also says, as far as we know, I'm just reading a couple sentences here. As far as we know, not one word did God ever speak to him in the company of men. Face down, he communed with his God. And the innate dignity of the man forbade that he assume this posture in the presence of others. How sweet and solemn, Tozer wrote, was the scene that night of the sacrifice when he saw the lamps of fire moving between the pieces of offering. There alone, with a horror of great darkness upon him, he heard the voice of God and knew that he was a man marked for divine favor. Tozer also points out Moses also was a man apart. It says here, the prophets of pre-Christian times differed widely from each other, but one mark they bore in common was their enforced loneliness. They loved their people and glory in the religion of the fathers, but their loyalty to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their zeal for the welfare of the nation of Israel drove them away from the crowd and into long periods of heaviness. I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children, cried one, and unwittingly spoke for all the rest. And then later on he says, there are some things too sacred for any eye but God's to look upon. Well, friend, this is where I believe we are. And if you want to cooperate with what God is doing and receive the utmost benefits of what he's doing at any given time, it's always best to hear directly from him. What does he want from you in this time? What does he want you to learn? What does he want to do in your relationship? How, how does he want to draw closer to you and you draw you closer to him? And I believe right now that God is calling us to a season. Now, this, you know this is going to be very unusual for me to say because I'm a big advocate of ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto us. Um, that's true and that's biblical and that's good and that's right. And I'll always say that because it's the word. But I believe in this season right now, God is calling us to a season. It's a bridegroom season. 
and where we simply sit and minister to one another's hearts. Now, here's what I mean by that. You know, I have a child. He's young. Um, he's just four. And um, But w- my child, I love him so much. And when I hug him, it just, just feels like all the parts of me here are, are back, you know, like a part of my heart is running around playing with him whenever he's gone. And when he, when he comes back into my arms and he gives me a big hug, it feels like all the rest of me has just come back and he's there. And I was trying to find the words for how to explain that to my child. And this is what I finally just figured I'll, I'll tell him because I, I couldn't really figure out the, the right words to capture it exactly. But I, I told him, Elijah, I was giving him a big hug, and I said, Elijah, when you hug me, your heart is next to my heart. And I tapped him on the chest and said, there's your heart. And I tapped myself. I said, here's my heart. And I said, when you hug me and your heart is next to my heart, my heart is so happy and our hearts are together. And he understood what I mean. And so now he's coming to me and just hugging me, saying, oh, I want to make your heart happy. So he gives me a big hug. And he, he says things like, can your heart feel that? Is your heart happy now, Mama? And I'm like, yes, my heart is so happy. And I give him a little squeeze, you know, and hold on as long as he'll let me. Well, I feel like God is calling us to that kind of season with him. And asking is good. And I'll talk about that more in just a minute. Seeking God and asking and claiming his promises are good things to do, and we should all be doing those. But right now, I feel like God is saying, come away with me and rest a while. Like he's seeing the labor, the stress, and the toil that you've been through. And all he wants to do is pick up his baby and pull your heart next to his heart and hold you for a time and a season. Is this resonating with anybody? Let me know in the comments, please. For whatever reason, I'm not able to see the comments, and I don't know why. But anyway, let let me know um, if this is resonating with you. I believe the Lord is wanting us to get rid of the things right now that are just surface level. And come away with him into a time of deep things. A time when our heart is simply next to his heart. And we can just rest in his arms, lay on his bosom. And allow all of who he is to soak through us again. I also hear the Lord talking about the last few days. I hear the Holy Spirit talk about the scripture in Isaiah. Look to the rock from which you were hewn. And many of you, if you think back over the last number of years, I believe you may notice some things that used to be in your life that were good that aren't there right now. Number one, the first thing that comes to mind is a flow of spirit-led creativity, but also a flow of anointing that used to be present on you where you used to carry the manifest glory of God I mean, people could see it on you. You felt him like that. You felt that glory and that weight of the Lord, that power of God. Your worship was full of the glory of God. And over time, hardship and trials and tests and tribulations have stolen that from you. Some of you used to write songs. Some of you used to sing. Some of you used to play your instrument to the Lord. But for many of you, those things have gone by the wayside. It's like the anointing and the flow of the power of the Holy Spirit has just dried up because you've just been surviving. And I believe right now, Holy Spirit is trying to pull you close so that he can resaturate you with that river, that river of his anointing and that river of his power and that river of his love. Because some of you, you've forgotten that God loves you. It's looked like for so long that he has just abandoned you and left you to be beaten down, beaten up, you know, um, and so on. And the fact is that he hasn't. And I don't understand and will never claim to understand why exactly. 
why exactly the Lord does allow us to go through some of these things. I know they hurt. I go through things too that hurt. But the fact is that he does work all things together for your good, my friend. And if you've been in a time and a season where it's almost like you, like leather, like you've become uh, so, um, like they cure leather, you know, it, it hardens and it becomes um, smooth and waterproof almost, and it becomes, um, you know, dry, dries out when leather is fresh. In other words, when the animal is freshly killed and the hide has been stripped off the animal and they're going to turn leather into something. I believe the Lord sees that your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions, and somewhat of your spirit has become so toughened like leather. And part of that is not a bad thing. Part of that is a good thing because your shoulders have grown so much broader over the last few years. And the trials and the tribulations have strengthened you and they've given you roots because it's an important skill in the kingdom to be able to say, God, I've come too far to look back. I'm not going back, God. I don't understand, God, but I trust you. I don't know when, God, but I trust you. I don't know why, God, but I trust you. I don't understand why you let me go through that, why you let them do that to me, why you let them say that, why you let them think that. I don't understand why you let this thing happen, why that diagnosis came, why this hardship or that trial or that accident happened, why that death in the family occurred. When we say, God, I don't understand, but I trust you. And that is the skill the Lord has been building in you over the last number of years. Now, I'm not saying that everything that's happened to you has been from the Lord. I don't know that. And anything that happened to you as a result of sin was definitely not from the Lord. But there are lots of trials we go through that aren't because of sin necessarily. They're just hard. And God does allow us to go through trials and tests. And if someone tells you otherwise, they haven't read their Bible. Okay, God does allow it, but all things work together for good, Romans eight twenty eight to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So God has been building those roots in you over the last number of years. But during that time of strengthening you and toughening you up to give you the spiritual, the mental, the moral fortitude to stand as the Apostle Paul wrote, and having done all to stand, you've had your armor on, you've done all the things, and you've just gotten to that place where you're in that having done all to stand, and you still see the warfare raging around you. But isn't it interesting in Ephesians chapter 6 when God says, you know, here's put, put on the armor, put on the armor, and it's the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, you gird your loins with the belt of truth, the shoes of the the preparation of the gospel of peace. You hold up the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, praying always in the spirit. And the apostle Paul writes that having done all, we stand. Isn't that interesting that there was no amount of fighting in there mentioned at all? We have on the armor, we're praying, we're believing God. But we just, after all those things, we just stand. Why? Because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. The carnal weapons are, oh, come on, we're going to fight, we're going to fight. Those are carnal weapons. Well, let's argue. Let me see if I can pay that person back. No, those are, those are evil things. That's not godly. That's not holy. Those are carnal, fleshly things that we should put off because that's not who you are anymore. But the spiritual weapons... Those are much harder to wield, honestly. The spiritual weapons are that shield of faith, that sword of the spirit, praying always in the spirit, and that rest in which, having done all, we stand. And now is that time for rest and rejuvenation. I believe a time for restoration. And I'm saying this by faith because I hear the Lord saying it, and I have been hearing him say it. To be perfectly honest, sometimes it takes us a while, once we start hearing it, it takes us a while to start receiving, not because God isn't already pouring out the thing that he's talking about, but because we have gotten so, I've almost wizened, we've gotten so, um, so tough from the long drought, 
that it takes time sitting in the presence of the Lord to get soft again. It's like mud. When you go out in the desert, you could go to any number of deserts if you have a mud flat somewhere. One that comes to mind is Death Valley here in the U.S. But any number of deserts, if you have mud flats and you have an extreme drought, the mud will crack. And it just looks like little tiny um, geometric patterns everywhere where the cracks, almost like the, the spots on a giraffe, you know. The ground just looks like that, and there are deep cracks sometimes in between. And the little pieces of mud might only be like the size of your hand. And when it starts to rain, it takes time for the water to really be able to soak in. And you'll notice this even if you have a house plant. If you let the plant go for too long and the dirt gets too dry, the dirt shrinks away from the pot. And then you'll water it, and the water just runs right off. It runs right down the side of the pot. It doesn't absorb it all. It just runs off because that dirt has gotten so tough. And it takes time. And sometimes you even have to go in and kind of mess up the top of the dirt a little bit and, uh, and open it up and break it up to be able to receive the water. And I believe that some of your souls are like that too, where you've been in such a drought for so many years that you've gotten to that point where, yeah, you're strong, but you've also gotten tough and leathery. And it's not any fault of your own. It's just the season you've been in. This has been what's required to sustain your life. You have done everything you could do. You've been in that place of having done all to stand. But God is pulling you into a season where small things are more important than big things, where the few are more important than the many. The quiet is the new loud. The intimate and private, quiet things that are hidden from people's eyes are more important than the public things. Why? So that he can pull your heart next to his heart and just hold you for a while and heal you. He's pulling you into a time of healing, of softening up your soul and your spirit to be able to receive again. Is this resonating with you at all? Say that that's me in the comments if this is you. Just let me know. Is that you? Just say, that's me, that's me, that's me, that's me. And you can, you know, if you feel like you've gotten so tough, and I'm not saying that badly at all. God had to toughen us up. Because some of you, just like me, and for, you know, for many years the Lord dealt with me about this, and then I thought I was all done, and then he's dealt with me about it some more. But some of you, just like me, have depended for years too much on your emotions and on how you feel from any given day. But, you know, as Spurgeon said, the strong are not always vigorous, the joyous not always happy. In order to get to the point, though, where you can stay in the joy of the Lord while you're going through hell, God has to put some roots on you and help you grow some roots and get and toughen you up, spiritually speaking, to be able to stand firm. And so these times are necessary. But in this season of growth, I believe God is calling you to the deep, the private, the intimate, the hidden time with him. And it's not, it's not just to talk about things that you think. For example, just yesterday I was in prayer. And I spent a while just praying and talking to the Lord. And, you know, I always want to pray first and foremost about what's most important to God. And, um, and yes, God cares about everything that we care about. But you know what's most important to him is that you and I should become more like Jesus. That's the most important thing. And so I make it a point. It's my passion to say, God, change my heart every day. Take away that old stony heart that I had yesterday and even right this second. Take it away, God, and give me a new a new heart. Let it be your heart. Take away my old spirit. Give me your spirit. God, make me like you. Let me love what you love and hate what you hate. Lord, but, and, and I just pray and ask the Lord and talk to him about the eternal things because those are more important than any of the temporal things. But yesterday, as I finished a season of prayer about those things, I felt, I hear the Lord told me, he said, he pointed me to my prayer list my um, that I fast and pray over. And, you know, I have a list of things written down that I'm asking the Lord to do, both for me, for my family, for many of my friends, for this ministry, and so on. 
And the Lord was saying, hey, pray through that. So I was like, okay. And I hadn't, I hadn't done that in a while. But, you know, this is a list of very practical, specific things, you know, things I'm asking for the Lord to provide or, or whatever. And I heard the Lord say as clear as a bell, he said, you've prayed about all the things that matter to me. Now I want to hear about what matters to you. And he wasn't saying that like, like I didn't care about the eternal things too. God knows I care. That's why I pray. But he was saying, you've ministered to my heart. Now let me minister to your heart. And that was so special to me. It really meant a lot. Because the things on that list, you know, I'm, I'm praying, you know, for things for the ministry. God, you know, bring all the people to London for our conference. God, I love our European readers so much. Bring them. And, you know, I've even some of our American readers have started to sign up, too. I'm so glad you'll be coming. And I'm praying, you know, God, provide for the ministry's needs financially. Provide for our staff, Lord. Bless our staff, Lord. Make them mighty, mighty men and women of God. And then things like, you know, that are personal to me. God, um, you know, we're going to need this or that coming up soon in our family. And Father, then y'all always hear me talk about this, but I still remind the Lord, Father, I desire so much for you to give me this so this particular um, stress relief tool is what it is, but it's a, a vehicle, a Chevrolet Corvette that I'm asking him for. Um, because I, I I know it's it's funny for a girl, but... Um, there are a few things that relieve stress in my life, and um, I've always had a passion since I was a child, thanks to my dad, who was a car nut. Um, I've always had a passion for cars that rumble. <laughs> and so, you know, so I was just praying through that list, and, and I felt the Holy Spirit and a Father just drawing so close to me because they were there to minister to me and let them know that they care about these things. Father cares. And God wants you to know the same thing. He is your Father. He is the Holy Spirit who dwells inside you. He is Jesus Christ, your Savior. And he sees the labor that you've put in. He sees the time and the effort, the energy and the prayers. He sees that you have given and loved from a sincere and pure heart. He sees how you've served both him and his people. And he wants to pull you away from that right now so that he can minister to you. I believe this is the word of the Lord for today. I still haven't been able to see in the comments, so I'll ask Gunnar and Dan who are behind the cameras. Has anyone said if this is resonating with them or not? Good, okay, that's good. Y'all, every season, God is still in control. The seasons don't always look different. I mean, the seasons don't always look the same, though. They look different. That's why they're called seasons. Things change. It's like spring, summer, fall, winter looks different. If they all look the same, we wouldn't have seasons. They would just be monotony. So as you're moving from one season into another, if this is resonating with you, I encourage you to jump on board with both feet and all, both arms and your whole heart to what God is doing in your life and don't fight him. Because it can be hard to change your mindset from God, let's go big, let's go big, let's go big to God, let's go home, let's go home, let's go home. You know, people say go big or go home. Well, God is saying go home. God is saying, you know, we tend to pray, even for ministry, God, grow my ministry, grow my ministry. But, you know, my heart, this is what, for years I've prayed. This is not, um, the live just ended, it says. Um, so anyway, um, Sorry, we're all y'all. We're just checking on technical things here. Um, let me know. Give me some comments. Say I'm here if you're still here, y'all. We have some technical issues. Okay, so we're you know we often pray things like, "God, grow my ministry," and 
what I was saying was that for years, what I've prayed is God. Yeah, I want I want growth. I want to fully perform all of your purposes for my life. But God, I'd rather impact a few people deeply than many people on the surface. I don't want to just be a surface level kind of kind of person. I'm not a surface level mentor. If if you want to mentor with me, that's great. But we're going deep. And I'll follow whatever the Lord is saying, and I'll talk to you about what the Lord is saying, and you need to talk to me about what the Lord is saying to you. But we're not going to just sit around here and say, you know, yay, I'm blessed and highly favored, and that's that's that. That's all we ever say. I mean, I'm glad we're blessed. I'm glad we're highly favored. We need to be grateful and so on. But let's talk about some deep things. Let's get real victory and real healing, and real roots, and real intimacy with God, and real power in prayer. And when you go to those places with God, not that many people will go with you. And honestly, lots of people will have something bad to say. But you know what? The deeper you get with the Lord, the less you care. I mean, yeah, it hurts. It hurts sometimes when people won't go with you. It hurts when people that you thought were covenant friends show themselves to not be friends at all. It it hurts when, you know, when there's some kind of situation and and your Gideon's army of thousands becomes Gideon's army of dozens. These things are hard. But you know what? Just to know him is worth all of it. That's why the Apostle Paul said that You know, he listed all of his qualifications. And he said, but I count whatever was gained to me, because I count as but loss. Because he was saying none of those things matter. The only thing that matters is that I may know him. And that's where we're going, and that's where we are. And so I want to encourage you right now to take your eyes off the things and set them on Jesus and be willing to just sit alone with the Lord and rest a while. Just be willing and let him tenderize your heart again. Let him bring you back into the flow in the river of his anointing. Let me know in the comments if you've missed that river of anointing. I'm not saying you haven't been flowing in power, but that anointing, that anointing of of creativity, that anointing of worship, that passion, that fire that made you just drive down the road in your car or sit in your office weeping under the glory with hunger for God that consumed you. If that's you and you've been in a place where you haven't felt like that, maybe even for a period of years, just say, "I'm." that's me and I've missed it. That's me and I've missed it. That's me and I've missed it. You can still flow in God's power and still operate in his unction without that deep soul feeding anointing. But God wants you to have that deep soul feeding anointing again. So he's pulling you back. He's pulling you away. He's saying, come away and rest a while. And just be alone with him. And when it comes to divine alignment, I believe that he's realigning people. You know, I was reading just uh, yesterday or the day before, I was reading a work of Spurgeon, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. From the 1800s, he was the pastor of the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, the mega church of its time. And he was talking about um, the difficulties of ministry. And specifically, he was talking about ministry because he was, it was, I was reading a lecture that he gave to his pastoral students, but it applies to anybody. And he pointed out how in the military, there are lots of enlisted men, say in the army, lots and lots, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, I don't know, lots, lots of soldiers. But then if you're going to work your way up, you know, there are fewer lieutenants than there are soldiers. There are fewer captains than there are lieutenants. There are fewer 
you know, whatever's next, I don't know. And he said, you know, when you get to the top, there are very few generals in the army. And he likened that to the spiritual walk with the Lord. You know, there are lots of people that have enlisted. They've prayed the prayer. They've given their lives to Jesus. They're saved. You know, they're bebopping along happily towards heaven. And that's great. But there are a few who have surrendered at a deep level and fewer still who have surrendered at an even deeper level and fewer still who have allowed the crucifixion to have total work in their lives to where they are truly manifesting the fact that they're dead to self and alive to Christ and fewer still who know God like that general of the faith, Abraham or Moses or Paul. And Spurgeon pointed out, you know, for Paul, he was very much a soul apart, not even Barnabas and Silas and Peter. They weren't in the same, at the same place where with Paul, where Paul was the one caught up in the third heaven and would heard things that are unspeakable to utter. But, you know, he could have a Barnabas beside him or a Silas beside him. And I know he was happy to have those people with him but it wasn't the same for them with God as it was for Paul and God John the beloved is another one that I believe had that level of relationship the one that repeatedly in the gospel of John he referred to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved he knew the love of God for him and he knew God he knew Jesus and John the Beloved was the one who was on the Isle of Patmos, imprisoned there for the sake of the gospel. And the book of Revelation records, he said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and suddenly I heard a voice, and I turned. And there was Jesus Christ himself in his glorified body. And John fell before Jesus as if dead. But the Lord strengthened him to hear the revelation. And it says in the book of Revelation, you know, right there in the first chapter, that this is literally the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to share with us. And can you imagine what a privilege that must have been to receive not only an apostleship and walking with Jesus and that call, but also to receive literally the revelation of Jesus Christ in his glorified body and the complete revelation of how he would end all of the days and how he would vanquish the, the kingdoms of this world. And literally, he saw how the kingdoms of this world would become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. He saw the second coming and he's the one who heard the voice saying, come up here and I will show you things to come. And he was caught up into the third heaven. And so we have our descriptions of heaven in large part because of John, because he knew God like that. Don't you want to be there? Don't you want to know God like that? I know I do. So I'm going to pray for you right now. Father, in Jesus' name, we just thank you. And I just ask that you would draw us to yourself and help us to cooperate with your drawing. Help us to come aside and rest a while. Lord, let our hearts be up against your heart. Pull us into yourself and rejuvenate us. Freshen us up, God. Immerse us and saturate us again in the river of your anointing. Make us soft and pliable in your hands. Flow through us again and refresh us. Lord, let our souls be well watered once again. And we'll give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Friend, thank you so much for watching today. This is a, a short session. I guess we've gone 40 minutes, but a short session. Um, we have some sickness in our staff, and so some people are not with us today. And we love them and we're praying for them and their families. But I just wanted you to know that God sees you. And the the things that are going on, um, as it says in, in the, the Apostle Peter wrote in his letters, Beloved, think it not strange 
when a fiery trial afflicts you. But know that God is working this out for you. Friend, I love you. Thank you so much for tuning in. Just a couple of quick announcements. Um, number one, of course, we always want to thank our partners. Thank you so much for your prayers and your generous giving. Everything that we do every single day is sponsored by our faithful partners. And um, if you are not yet a partner, if you haven't sowed a seed recently, please click on the link in the link tree in the description for this video or go to our website at fromhispresence.com. And you can click give there and sign up to become a partner. Also, um, our women's retreat is going to be here in our offices. We're working so hard to get everything ready for you. We have people signing up already. It's just going to be small. Me and about 15 ladies, as well as our staff. And we're just going to fill up the sofas here. And family style, we're going to do mentoring on the topic of deep it's only $99. That includes two solid days of teaching, about 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., and includes lunch both days. And then you can have dinner on your own, breakfast on your own, and you can find lodging at any number of hotels at all different price points right down here um, around the hub. There are just hotels everywhere. That's one of the reasons we're here. And so please sign up for that. You can go to our website, from fromhispresence.com, click on Events, and you can see the sign-up links for that. That is ne the November 17 and 18, so that's in two weeks, okay? And then also um, an update on the parsonages for pastors. We got through yet an another level of bureaucracy approvals, and so we have just a couple of things to finish up with all of those government approvals on our plats and our surveys and our uh, stormwater and engineering and things like this. So those um, things are happening very quickly. So please be in prayer for that. And then also we do have a new book, Speak Life Volume 2. It's currently in line at the press to be printed. It'll be just a few days and we'll be able to ship that to you. If you haven't gotten your copy, pre-order your copy in paperback in the USA or you can get the ebook internationally. Next week we will be streaming same time, same place, and we've actually added an additional day of streaming and encouragement. We will be next Friday at 12 noon, just like always, but then also, and that's Eastern time, also we are now adding Tuesdays at 12 noon as well. That way twice a week we have people um, who aren't in church or maybe they're so we have literally people who would have to drive hours to find a physical church because they live out in the middle of the prairie or the desert and so they listen to our broadcast and this is their church so we wanted to add that tuesday so that you could have that twice a week encouragement so tuesday at, at 12 noon and fridays at 12 noon put it on your calendar put it in your phone as an appointment Listen while you're driving down the road, eating your lunch, at your desk at work or whatever, okay? Please share this video also. And just let people know this is a prophetic word about what you're going through right now. We appreciate that so much. Friend, I love you. We're going to go ahead and sign off. And I just wanted you to know that we love you and we are praying for you every single day. Hope you have an awesome day. Send us an email if I can help with anything at all. All right, we love you. Have a great day.